of a human being, which is given by the ancient sages of the East. And it's something that, uh, for some reason, we here in the West have either forgotten or ignored or it doesn't suit us. And my proposition to you tonight is that the time for this vision is, is here and is in fact now and is happening. And what we've been doing here at St. James this last, well, nearly a decade now, and what I'm sure will continue to happen is that we will connect with this vision and make it real for the boys and for the families that are associated with St. James, because I think and I hope that you will recognize that since you've been a part of the school, it has been a family matter, not just the boys coming here, but as much as has been humanly possible, it is a matter for the whole family to be engaged in. So what is this uh, vision? It's a very ancient one, and yet it's an equally modern one. It's not the vision of a human being as a person who has uh, uh, a body and full of blood and bone and bile and all that kind of stuff. If you ever really look inside your body, what's in there, you may not be as cheerful about it as you look from the outside. This vision, unfolded by the ancient ones, was that there is in the heart of every human being an innate brilliance which shows itself as uh, pure consciousness, which enlivens everything, which shows itself as uh, pure love, which connects everything, which shows itself as pure intelligence, which illuminates everything, and that that rests in the hearts of each and every person, each and every person sitting in this room and each and every boy coming to the school. In fact, each and every child coming to any school in the country. But we do try to acknowledge that that is the case. And that this brilliant intelligence and enormity of love and consciousness, we say lives in the heart, but is not confined by the human heart, not in the least. So where is it? And what is the function of school, and what is the function of home in relation to it? And the wise ones tell us that this brilliance lives in space. And that that space enters into every physical body, enters into every mind, enters into every heart, permeates it completely. Now, this was a vision unfolded well before Moses was a boy. So it's got its antiquity. But the scientists today at University College and up the road at Oxford and uh, further East, I think it's East, wherever, at Cambridge. The scientists there are saying today, guess what this human being is made of? It's made of space. That if you take those extraordinary mic uh, magnifying glasses that these scientists have connection with, and you really look, what are you seeing? You're seeing space and space and space. And have you ever wondered, have you ever wondered how it is that this right hand knows to gesticulate at this particular point and this right foot knows to tap at this particular point and if you try to put a circle on your foot, you could do this at the moment, if you try to put a circle on your foot one way and, and your hand moving in another way, it's almost damn well impossible to do that. How is that possible in the human embodiment? Have you ever wondered, this is a, a remark addressed to the ladies, how it is that having given birth to your child, you have milk available to feed it? Is this not intelligent? 
Have you ever wondered that you're sound asleep in the middle of the night and the child awakens and somebody somewhere wakens you up to deal with the child? This is love. Is this not? Who can stop who can stop attending to the child who's fallen over and grazed his or her knees? This is love. Where's this come from? The ancients would say these are just simple examples of this great power or these great powers of love and intelligence and consciousness living in the space, permeating every human being. This lecture normally takes place in the autumn uh, for various reasons. As many of you know, I've been this year engaged in other matters. The autumn got a bit busy, so we moved it to the spring. We love seeing the trees with their full coat and the flowers and occasionally even the sun shining. Do we not? And we so enjoy the spring, but has anybody ever seen the spring? Spring itself? Where is that? The ancient ones have told us this lives in the space. Now, my proposal, ladies and gentlemen, to you tonight is that education, the real nature of education, is the ability of the child is the ability of the parent and is the ability of the teacher to connect with this pre-existing brilliance, this consciousness, this love, and this intelligence resting in the space and permeating each and every person. Now, the ancient one said something else, and it's very appropriate at this particular time and on this particular night. They said that there will come a time when the darkness of the world begins to move. Some of you I know, looking around, are connected with your studies of philosophy. These times were described as the great yuga of the world. These are massive movements of time in that space. And these wise souls said there will come a time when the darkness of the world begins to shift, when the lethargy of the world begins to shift. Now, I don't know about you, but I do think, although it's got plenty of negatives associated with it, that something like, for example, the internet is inherently brilliant by itself. What does the internet use? It uses space. I think it's an amazing description of the human connection with intelligence to make the space somehow available. That's the mechanics of it. But what about the ability of people through the internet to connect with each other? We haven't yet got there. We need a shift in energy to make those connections. So these wise ones indicated that there are great movements of time, great movements of ages, and that there will be a time when the darkness of the world starts to shift and men and women and young people particularly will start to perceive things differently. They will have available to them a different level of energy, a more reflective energy. To the boys, we describe this as a more swan-like power. The power just to, as it were, meet whatever life is putting towards you, but to meet it without involvement and without anxiety and maintaining an evenness. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to propose to you that there is clear evidence that this time is coming that this time, in fact, in many ways, might even be here. The Internet is just one such example of human brilliance. Uh, you will probably know that not very far down the track, there will be cars driven without drivers. Even last night, they were proposing, those of you who watch BBC television, 
that there would be aeroplanes flown without pilots. Actually, we had a conversation with a Virgin pilot recently, and he did indicate to us that that had already arrived, mainly because the Virgin pilots were asleep. But nonetheless, <laughs> there would be planes flown without pilots. Isn't that remarkable? Cars without drivers, planes without pilots. I don't think that they will have yet been able to invent uh, people to love without the human connection, but maybe they're probably working on that. But there are remarkable events occurring and happening at this particular time. And why is this? Because there's a new energy which is enabling more and more people to connect with this pre-existing love and intelligence and consciousness. And here at St. James, we have been doing our very best over the years to so sensitize the boys that they can connect with this new energy. And when they do connect with this energy, and I'm sure as their lives unfold they will continue with this connection in some way or another, you will naturally find that they are positioned to lead. To lead in what way? To lead in the way of love, to lead in the way of intelligence, to lead in the way of empathy, to lead in the way of kindness, to lead in the way of compassion. So leadership and connection need to be at the heart of any education that is unfolding. The future, in my view, of education needs to be about this space connection. Now, this year, the governors, thank you, Mr. Storey, and my colleagues, particularly Mr. Kleiss and Mr. Neve and Mr. Fletcher and Mr. Johnson and others, have been very kind in this way that they have allowed me to be released from St. James on a daily basis. And as uh, chairman of the United Kingdom Society of Head Teachers, to go and, and meet with many teachers, many schools, many headmasters of all kinds, not just private schools, independent schools, not just big schools, but small schools, academies, massive schools, and to talk about a new vision for education. And I've sought to unfold to them four key points. Her Royal Highness Princess Anne uh, kindly accepted an invitation. You may remember she landed a helicopter here. Remember that? She came in a helicopter because they couldn't, wouldn't land her at Heathrow. And they said to me, is there a price for this? I said, yes, she's better come and speak at my conference. Uh, and she did, and we got into communication and conversation. And she came down to Wales, where we held this conference, uh, and participated in the debate where I sought to unfold the following four points. And she took a few notes. And then she asked the headmaster of Eton, and the headmaster of Harrow, two very good friends of mine, what they were doing about this, and they were very grateful for my intervention. <laughs> so what was this new framework which was put uh, before my colleagues and has been put uh, before a number of people during the course of this year? The first is that to connect with the space needs the cultivation of the power of concentration and awareness. Concentration is at the heart of all education. You cannot connect with that brilliance of love and intelligence and consciousness without concentration. With concentration, education can be much swifter. My advice to you would be to make sure the new headmaster focuses on making sure the boys concentrate because really they only need one term of education a year. Think how much money you could save. <laughs> Without concentration, absolutely nothing is possible. But take it on a little bit. Without concentration, you and I, as elderly people, will not be able to be cared for. You and I, as grandparents and grandmothers and grandfathers, will not be able to look after our younger generation. 
They will certainly ignore us unless they've been taught how to concentrate. You haven't spent all that money on a private education for your offspring in order to be ignored in your old age, have you? Hmm? Concentration is at the absolute heart of connection with this great power which is increasingly being made available to the world at this time. So the first aspect of the framework of the new education paradigm, as I put it, is the cultivation of the power of concentration and awareness. And that means living in the present moment. Now just think, where do your worries rest? Most of your worries, are they not? Rest somewhere in the mental space of the future. Is that all right? What is going to happen? The other part of your worries, I suspect, are concerned with what has already happened. And uh, I've not yet found the magic cure of fixing what has already happened. I'm not sure that will ever be fixable, other than letting it be released from your mind. Most of education is about filling up with things. It's a very Aristotelian perspective. What we seek to do here, following the Platonic view, is to empty, 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 to release, to bring forth, to bring out. Young people in particular, if you see them, if you leave them for a weekend on their own, you know this better than I now, if you leave them for a weekend on their own, they will fill up with all sorts of stuff, not necessarily good stuff, from all sorts of different sources. So Monday mornings come here, we have to empty them, empty them, empty them. Empty out so that they can connect and receive this intelligence and love and consciousness that is available in the space, permeates each and every one of them, and yet they forget it. So cultivating the power of concentration is the first thing. Here at St. James, we've done many things in the last uh, years to help this power grow. One of them is we insist, as you well know, for boys, particularly below the sixth form, to write with a fountain pen. Sounds a very innocent idea. But when you are writing with a fountain pen and you've got your attention where the nib is meeting the paper, if you take your attention away, the blessed ink doesn't flow. So you have to bring your attention back. I was being interviewed recently uh, by uh, BBC Radio, I think, and they said, what's the one thing you would do to increase the power of concentration in schools other than meditation? Because they know I beef on about meditation. And I said, I'd make sure the children wrote with a fountain pen. I thought... Uh, it would be ridiculed. In fact, it wasn't ridiculed. It was, oh, that's a very simple notion. That's not, not going to cost a fortune, is it? How much is a fountain pen by comparison to an iPad? Hmm? Not that much. So this is the first of the, as it were, pillars of this new educational paradigm. Cultivate the power of concentration. Secondly, allow your pupils to grow an understanding of what I've called human interdependency. Uh, sitting in front of me uh, a few weeks ago in an assembly, I wrote about this in one of our newsletters, I said to the boys, do you realize that I need you probably rather more than you need me at this very moment? What is the point of a headmaster without any pupils. I have met headmasters who think they're headmasters when they have no pupils in sight, and broadly they're fairly bonkers. But we are interdependent. I, I need you at this moment, probably rather more than you need me, because in order for this knowledge, whatever it is, to be presented to you tonight, you have got to be there. So there is a natural human interdependency which is built in to the human framework. 
and too little of our educational uh, exercises seek to recognize this independency, interdependency. So what happens? The child, when he or she is born, seems to be pretty dependent, particularly on a mother to begin with for food, latterly on a father, and certainly as he or she grows up, mother and father, male and female forces, certainly need to be around. But there's a sort of sense of dependency. The age of two, the child knows, inherently, I am not dependent. That's the terrible twos you meet. The child begins to express itself fairly independently. We manage to sit on that, don't we? Yeah, for a bit. Uh, we let them grow through their primary school. And then they come to a senior school. And to begin with, uh, they still maintain a sense of being dependent. Uh, they manage to convince you that they need you in order to bring them to school. That without you looking after them, they not be safe. They've convinced you of this. Uh, or they've been willing to accept it. And then they reach about 13, and lo and behold, that streak of independence kicks in again, doesn't it? And you go through the puberty world and adolescence and so forth, and we've spoken about this in past years. What they really need as they're growing through that phase is a far clearer notion of what it means to be interdependent. The male interdependent with the female the Christian the Jew the Muslim the Hindu, the Sikh interdependent with each other on the single love of God imagine what would happen to the world if such an interdependence could be established just the very physical actions that we have in daily life looking after each other is an expression of interdependency Imagine what could happen if our, they call it PSHE programs, our programs looking at the more social and moral and spiritual dimensions of our education could actually unfold this notion of interdependency. And then we would get to the point where the youngster recognized actually we really are just one human family. We may look different from the outside, but each one of us can connect with this love, this consciousness, this intelligence. This power in us is actually the very same power. We've had, in the last uh, few years, probably well over 500 schools or representatives of different educational organizations come to St. James and look at what we do here. And a very, very common comment at the end of it is people leave saying, there's an extraordinary harmony about the boys in your school. What, what do you do? How do you create this? Well, one of the first things we do is each boy who has got a place here at St. James has had an interview with the headmaster who's asked him to expound in his own words, the boy's own words, that is, what the boy understands by interdependency. What would happen to the world, I usually ask the boys, if more people could understand that the Spirit of God lives in every single heart, no matter what you call that power? What would happen to the world? More peace, sir. More harmony, sir. More happiness, sir. How would that work? Well, we'd be kinder to each other. We'd want to look after each other. We'd recognize the value in each other. These are the sorts of comments I've now had for nearly a decade from your sons. Now, believe it or not, your sons answered those questions very positively, which is why they came here. Yes, they sat tests, but the tests were purely an indicator. The real thing was... How did they respond to those kinds of questions? And each and every one of them had a very positive response to this sense of human interdependency and the fact that we belong to the same human family. It's a beautiful notion, isn't it? Beautiful notion. 
rather radical by comparison to perhaps where the national media often wish to take us. So the cultivation of awareness and concentration, the sense of our human interdependency belonging to the same human family. Third value, if you know you belong to the same human value, family, the third value will be easily exercised. That's the love, care, and service one for the other. What we notice is the boy's love to serve. Well, we're going to dine very shortly in the uh, dining room, and uh, each day at our lunchtime, the boys are encouraged to look after each other. Sometimes happens, sometimes doesn't happen, sometimes happens better than o- at other times. But uh, under the uh, guidance and inspiration of Mr. Fletcher, uh, the younger boys, the years seven and eight, each get an opportunity to serve at a table, at the teacher's table, head's table. Uh, and recently I, I said to uh, one of the lads, um, haven't you done this before? And he said, yes, but don't tell Mr. Fletcher. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I, we do, I love doing it. I, lo- I love doing it. And he did it extraordinarily well. Um, I think uh, Marco Pierre White and others should start to shake in their boots because I suspect he's headed in that direction. But um, it's just so beautiful to see this love of service as being so natural. Where have we as a society headed? We've headed into what we call self-service, haven't we? Pull up at a petrol station, self-service. The last person who served in a petrol station is the self, actually. It's ego service, the petrol station. And if you don't really fully appreciate that, you wait till somebody says there's a shortage. And then you'll see they're kicking in of that other side of human nature, which we're not going to talk too much about tonight. But a world based on and an education system which magnifies and exemplifies the value of service would have a real impact on humankind. And finally, and this is very relevant to tonight's topic, the fourth of the pillars. We've had concentration and awareness as one, We've had the sense of interdependency in the human family. It's the second one. Third one is the value of keeping and helping to teach and allowing opportunities to serve. And the fourth value is the recognition that each and every child is innately brilliant. And if you recognize that value, because they are, because they've got the ability to connect with this divine brilliance I'm talking about, if you recognize that as a value, you will naturally put in programs which open the boys' hearts, or girls' hearts. You will naturally put in programs which help to clarify and clear clear their minds. You will naturally put in programs which keep them fit and healthy in their bodies. And, of course, you will naturally enable them to feel the spirit within them. And of all these visitors that come to this particular school, they say, my God, your chaps are spirited. But that's what a spiritual education means. It doesn't mean a holy one. It doesn't mean a sort of pious one. It means a spirited education. And these lads are certainly expounding that. So it raises the question, how do you bring out this pre-existent brilliance? And I would say there are three things equally applicable in school to home, equally applicable at home to school. If school does this, but home forgets it, the disconnect occurs. If home does it and school forgets it, the disconnect occurs. You need both home and school working on this together. First thing, very obvious, all three of these, extremely obvious. You will not bring out the brilliance unless you see it. When you look at your son, I know you love him, it's pretty obvious. Do you see his brilliance? Uh, I'm very pleased to see that one or two of you are nodding (laughs) in the affirmative uh, because they are brilliant. But there are certainly times when we don't necessarily see this the Buddha put it put it in a very beautiful way you you basically live in a world that you project from your own mind 
What you want to live in is the world you project through your own mind. So to bring out the brilliance, the teacher, every day, every morning and every afternoon, and mornings and afternoons are different because the energies change, the teacher has to see the brilliance is there. Now, the boy may not be absolutely demonstrating his full brilliance at full power every day of the academic year. That is a given. He may not even be doing it when he comes home from school. But it's there. And you won't get it out unless you know it's there. So that's the second point. Seeing it and then really knowing it. And why is it important to know it as well as to see it? Because there are times when he's not demonstrating his fullness, his complete brilliance. And you've got to maintain your faith in him. I'm talking about him. The same applies to girls, of course. You have to maintain your faith in him until once again it starts to shine. Now, there's a bit of a catch here because to see it and to know it in him means, first and foremost, you have to know something of your own brilliance, too. In other words, you have to see it in yourself. If I was to say to you, and I put this same question to groups of teachers around the country this past year, how many of you are brilliant? Okay, how many of you are brilliant? Hands up. Oh, very good. There's some of you are listening. Excellent. <laughs> um, it's a very reluctant thing to do is to put your hand up and say, yeah, I'm brilliant. Um, not my ego, but there's something in me which I know to be brilliant. God, imagine the world if we could get young people actually inwardly acknowledging that they are brilliant. So we have to, as teachers and parents, see it, we have to know it, and then we have to, above all, encourage it. Now, how do you encourage something like this? You speak it into existence. Now, I, I have run into a bit of trouble this year on this third point, speaking it into existence, because people have said to me, are you hoodwinking the children when you speak it into existence? I said, no. You're simply speaking what's actually true about them rather than speaking what's untrue about them. The reality is that they are conscious, loving, and intelligent. Every single one of them. They may demonstrate it very differently. That's the reality. So you speak that reality into existence. We have some key phrases I give to the boys, particularly when I was taking the philosophy, and I think some of them have remembered it, which is very nice and encouraging. Phrase one, there are no limits other than those you put on yourself. There are no limits other than those you put on yourself. What do you mean, sir? Well, there's the geography paper. How do you think you're going to do before you start? Well, I'm probably not going to do very well, sir. Why not? Well, I haven't done any revision, sir. Um, why, why are you thinking about that now? What, what is that doing to block your innate intelligence at this very moment? It's a very funny thing about education. Um, it's a bit like a bath. If you get into a bath, you are bound to get wet. If you get into a classroom, no matter how or what is going on inside it, there is bound to be some knowledge, some connection, some love, some intelligence. Bound to be. It's just what the nature of a classroom is. The brilliant teacher connects and allows the pupil to connect. The less brilliant teacher tries to teach something. Shall I say that again? The brilliant teacher allows the connection. The less brilliant teacher tries to teach something usually with limits. So there is always something going on, some connection of some kind taking place. And you only limit yourself by your own ideas. I can't do this. I won't do this. I don't like this. I wish this would stop. I don't know whether you recognize any of those inner thoughts when you were at school, do you? Hmm? Uh, remarkably, these things do seem to 
passed down the generations, I have to admit. Um, if you can shift that notion, then you begin to open into that space. That's one phrase. Here's another phrase. Whatever you think you can do, you can do. Whatever you think you can do, you can do. Kind of the antithesis of the first statement. You think about that for a moment. So Bradley Wiggins, struggling a little bit at the moment up the Italian mountains, clearly thought he could conquer the world. And in 2012, he did. His uh, competitors thought that he, Bradley Wiggins, could con conquer the world. And uh, they let him conquer the world in 2012. They've now changed their mind. That's all that's happened. I don't know. I, happen to f I enjoy watching these things and reading about these things. There's a big question. They posed it in relation to Sir Alex Ferguson as well. What psychologically has changed for Sir Bradley Wiggins this time round, which causes his legs to feel heavier? He doesn't know. I would say the answer to that particular question is he doesn't fully now think he can do it, and everybody else also now doesn't fully think he can do it, so he can't. So I say to the boys, whatever you think you can do, you can do. Just do it. And of course, you have to practice. That's pretty essential. And the third statement, don't worry about the future. Just take the now step, what I call the now step. Not the next step, the now step. Our limits, particularly going back to the point of limiting yourself, our limits are so much set by our mind that we can't do it somewhere in the future. It's too much for us. I can't take that journey. It's too big. No, just take the now step. The remarkable thing when you take the now step in any situation is the next now step is then available to you. And so you keep moving. Now, I would propose, ladies and gentlemen, that if teachers and homes dealt with these three things together, seeing their brilliance, knowing they're brilliant, therefore not doubting when it doesn't necessarily show itself so clearly, and encouraging their brilliance by speaking it into existence, then what would begin to manifest are some truly brilliant young people in this new space. I'm trying to put forward to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a new space tradition emerging. There's a new way of looking at what education is actually all about. You've heard me say this before, so I'm not tonight going to go too much into it. Seven out of the ten jobs that your sons will get have not yet been invented. So it's actually pointless educating them in just simple skills, which is what the traditional pedagogy is all about and approach to education they need something extra and it's been beautiful just to reflect in, prepar in preparation for tonight just on some of the examples of your sons and how brilliant that they've been I, I, I remembered uh, one group of uh, year 10 drama boys who uh, were so powerful in their presentation of the Abafan disaster in Wales and the Iraqi war that visitors to the drama studio on the uh, open night uh, appealed for them to stop because it was too emotional. Um, what the boys managed to do, and this was the brilliant thing, was to capture the real sensitivity, the inner story of those things. I have uh, uh, reflected on, on, on one lad. His name is Justin. Um, he is really bright. Uh, and he was a real goody two-shoes as well. I, I actually remember the first report I wrote to his parents, which was, dear Mr. and Mrs., I'm delighted to tell you that Justin got into trouble today. Um, now, Justin, bright as buttons, academically, and lovely lad too, uh, he scored 11 A stars in his GCSE, 
and he missed the Whitbread Prize, that's the pupils, that's the top pupil in the country, he missed the prize by half a point. Half of one point. And I was, we were, of course, very delighted with his performance. But the thing, the brilliance in Justin was the humility with which he accepted that half a point defeat. That's what I will remember. The absolute humility of it. He said something like, well, I'm sure the other chap was better. And he just got on with things. Fantastic, wonderful sense of interdependency, of connection, of all of the things I've been trying to speak about tonight. And then there's Isaac. Isaac's still at the school here. Uh, Isaac is uh, not going to be uh, a professor of um, anything, uh, basically. Um, but he's going to be a hell of a lad because he gets in a, once he gets into a canoe and he paddles, he paddles and he paddles and he paddles and he paddles. He paddles for miles. I mean, literally, for miles down the Thames. Anywhere there's water, Isaac will paddle. He'll keep going. The absolute endurance. Isaac, how do you do it? Well, sir, I just put one paddle in the water after the other. That's how I do it. Yeah. Taking the now step. It's true enough, your lads probably don't go home and think philosophically or speak to you in philosophical language, the language I'm using to you tonight, but they're actually living it. They are the... They are the brilliant examples of the brilliance that I'm trying to indicate is essential in a, a real education. And then there are the teachers I've mentioned already so far, the boys learning to serve under Mr. Fletcher's care, but... Uh, and the brilliance of our sports head of sport, Mr. Wassell, who I could tell stories about nearly every member of staff. These are the ones I just reflected on. When the Olympics came around, what did he think? He said, let's give the boys an experience of the whole Olympic Games. And that meant, let's give the boys an experience also of the Paralympic Games. And do you know, I, I, I was nearly in tears when I looked and I saw these boys strapped to chairs trying to learn how to be a Paralympic basketball player. And when the boys were asked, when they came back after the Olympics, in the beginning of the new academic year, which of the Olympic sports would you like to repeat? They said, please forbid, we're not going to Paralympics. So back came the wheelchairs, back came all of that assistance. The brilliance was in his ability, the sports master's ability, to connect with the essential human emotion of what it takes to compete as an athlete and what it takes to compete in particular as a para, para, paralympic athlete. And then I was thinking, do you know, one of the things we've done for years and years and years is put in place by my predecessor, my own sons did it, and we still do it, and that's we take boys in year 10 to Florence every year. What a brilliant notion that was, whoever it was, probably Mr. Nicholas Devers. To take formulative young people to the heart of the Renaissance and to give them the experience. We're very fortunate from Dr. Hipshaw. We have a man who is living the experience of what the Renaissance painters were all about, and what the Renaissance sculptors were all about, and the Renaissance architects were all about. And so he gives them that taste of their own size, and magnitude, and consciousness, and love, and above all, intelligence. Just three examples that I think we've been embraced by with the staff here at St. James. Now, what does it take to make sure that this gets embedded in the way in which the boys live there? Lives. At home and in school, and from school and university and into the workplace. It, it takes what I describe as a confident humility. A confident humility. And I think this is the quality that I will remember most about your sons when the day comes for me to walk out the door for the last time. 
what is this confident humility and how have I seen it? We start to say to the boys, your success is your neighbor's success, your neighbor's success is your success. And it's beautiful to see a boy sharing his success with his neighbors. And this quite often happens. Small ways, could be uh, just when they're tossing a cricket ball around the cricket nets, uh, or in much larger ways. It could be when they win a headmaster's accommodation or their piece of work is chosen to go up on the board to show the quality of their work, particularly the quality of their attention. Your success is my success, my success is your success. This is moving away from having me, the ego me, as number one in your life. And uh, I would propose, and I do to the boys, that the ego me, the number one in your life, is the thing that's going to trip you up the most, particularly when you get into the workplace. So they get a sense, confidently, humbly, of what it means to share their success. And of course, if you're going to lead a team at any time, you need to share success with your team. And secondly, and very connected to the first, that kind of idea that your success is my success clearly leads to a sense of brotherhood. I think in boys' schools, this is something that we can easily generate. In mixed gender schools, as I've been around the country, it's not so easy to generate a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood. But in a boys' school, it does seem to be more clear and easier to do. And they've got a sense, confidently, and with humility, that, that they are together, that they are part of a single human family. And that's beautiful. And then, of course, finally, and it's important, their sense is that the Spirit of God, the power of creativity, the sense of being, the sense of being divine, that Spirit is in the hearts of everybody. When the boys sitting where you are sitting at the moment, in the mornings, close their eyes, and they meditate, and the Christian boy is sitting next to the Hindu boy, is sitting next to the Muslim boy, is sitting next to the Sikh boy, and the Jewish boy, and so forth, and the boy of absolutely no religion. What are they doing? Whatever they're doing, is they're connecting with their inner power, their brilliance, their God, their spirit, their self. Call it by whichever name you want. All of this, the Dalai Lama described as an education in warm heartedness. And he said, and I fully accord with this, he said that the need today is not more academic institutions. The need today is not more driving forward for academic success. The need today are schools and higher educational institutions where warm-heartedness prevails. To be educated in warm-heartedness. So this is what I have been endeavouring to propose, ladies and gentlemen. And it is also what I have been endeavouring to offer your sons over these years. And I'm also equally confident that Mr. Brazier will take up the same spirit and ensure that St. James continues to be a beacon of light in warm houses. When you're warm hearted, you feel naturally free. When you're warm-hearted, you feel naturally pure. And when you're open-hearted and warm-hearted, and you can't be warm-hearted without being open-hearted, you gain a sense of your own immortality. That your spirit somehow is immortal. I don't know whether the boys have been rash enough to ever tell you that they've been told that they're not going to die. <coughs> Because they're immortal beings, of course they're not going to die. Then I said to them, have you ever found 
anybody who's ever seen themselves being born? I don't know, I'll ask you, has anybody ever seen themselves being born? None of us have seen ourselves being born. And we can't die. So what's this process that we're living through at this particular time? In your spirit, I tell the lads, you are immortal, you are pure, and you are above all free. So what should the next generation of schools do? What should the next generation of homes allow? As the times change, as these great energies move, as the space expands, so to conclude, I would say the following. Offer your sons at school and at home the very space as the emotional space to be free, to know that they are free, to realize that they are free as human beings. Secondly, allow them the space. This takes a bit of courage to explore. I'm not here talking about exploring the internet. I think if they do, they go to the other side of that. But to explore nature, to climb a mountain, to jump out of the plane and parachute, of course. To taste things. To go where others haven't gone. I was talking to the headmaster of Eton, and they unfortunately lost a pupil on one of their expeditions. You may recall reading the uh, youngster who met a polar bear. It was a mauled by the polar bear. And I said to the headmaster, what are you going to do? Are you going to reconsider these kind of trips? And he very boldly said, uh, no. No, we're going to continue to explore. It's very sad for the parents, very sad for the family of the school that these accidents occur. We're going to do our best to make sure they don't occur. But we are going to continue to allow the children to explore and to give them the space to do that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be dangerous either. But the other day, uh, one of our teachers, uh, in our quiet time period in the afternoon, decided that they would explore meditation by lying on their backs, on the ground, under the trees, looking at the space and the light between the leaves and the trees. What a brilliant way to meditate. Fantastic exploration. Explore. And so much exploration can be happening at home as well as at school. <coughs> and then finally, I would say we need to give the young people space to accept everybody for who they are. In their hearts, to accept people of all religions, to accept people of all races, to accept people of all genders, to accept people of all backgrounds. When we pray, in assembly in the mornings we say the universal prayer at the end of the prayer in Sanskrit the Lord's Prayer and often I say to the boys just embrace in your hearts it could be the people of Nicaragua because of a problem that they're facing the soldiers in Iraq because of the problem that they're facing or even the elderly people in Ashford because of the chance that those people are going to have to, to get a better life just embrace them in your hearts. Love them. Love them. I have to say some of my colleagues today are bananas when I started doing this. Until the boys start to say, well, it kind of means something to us. We can accept in our heart all of these people. What stops them accepting are our ideas about other people. And so I would encourage teachers and people at home to ensure that the space for accepting all remains wide open. The human heart is certainly large enough to embrace all, and it is certainly important that the space ages to flourish, as I'm calling it, for that wholeness and acceptance to be full. So to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be very attentive. Thank you very much. I find myself uh, hugely optimistic at the end of my time here at St. James. Optimistic because I think the times are changing. I think
think the space is opening. I think the sense of brilliance is what the world of education needs. And I would even say so much as to say that I just get the sense that, that we are not the only people thinking this. We are not the only school doing this. And going forward, the young people who emerge from St. James will naturally lead in a spacious, in a loving, in an intelligent, and above all, in a conscious way, because they will know whatever their language, whatever words they use, they will know that inside them is a divine being, which really is.